And tonight, uh, I do have a quorum, that's good. <laughs> so I'm going to call this meeting to order, uh, and I want to first thank Harrison Park for hosting tonight. We don't have anyone here from the school to say a few words, but I do want to just thank them for hosting, and I'll um, thank our first ward commissioners for hosting here in the, on the west side. Um, so as we get our meeting started tonight, I'm going to ask you to join me uh, for a moment of silence before we do Pledge of Allegiance. So if you'd please join me in standing. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, next we'll have a roll call. Commissioner Kelly? Here. Commissioner O'Connor? Present. Commissioner Lanier? Present. Commissioner Allen, coming. No. Okay. Commissioner Jones, uh, here. Commissioner Repart, on his way. And Mayor Bliss. Yes. So um, Commissioner Repart will be joining us late. But can I get a motion to excuse Commissioner Jones and Commissioner Allen from tonight's meeting? So moved. so moved. Support. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed. It carries. All right. So next, that will take us to our first opportunity for public comment. So if you haven't been to a city commission meeting before, I'll just walk you briefly through the agenda so that you are familiar with the process. Um, so we have three opportunities for public comment, and the very first opportunity is if you're here to speak about something that we're actually voting on tonight. So on the agenda, there's a whole list of items that we talked about earlier in, earlier in the day during our standing committee meetings uh, that we'll be voting on. So if you're here tonight to speak about one of those specific items, I'll open up that opportunity for public comment moment Momentarily. And then we have some scheduled public hearings. Uh, we have one scheduled public hearing, uh, and this is establishing property taxes and proposed fiscal year 2019 city budget. So if you're here to speak about the city budget, I'll be opening up that public hearing a little bit later on. And then at the very end of the meeting is when we have public comment about anything else that is on your mind. So if you're here tonight to speak about something that we're voting on, I'm going to open it up for public comment. We ask that you share your name and the city that you live in and then the, the specific item that we're voting on that you're here to speak about. And then up at the podium here, you'll see a list and we ask that you write down your name just to make sure that we can spell it right and have it accurate in the minutes. So if you're here tonight to speak about something that we're voting on, now's an opportunity to come forward. Hi, welcome. Thank you, I will be speaking on what was on committee in the whole, D um, number seven, recommendation 11, um, setting a public hearing. Um, so my name is Jolanda Howe, I'm from the Creston neighborhood, and I'm part of Grand Rapids Homes for All. I wanna thank the commission, I wanna thank the, ooh, that's really, <laughs> now I wanna thank the commissioners who spoke up about this, um, ordinance this morning and talked about the things that they saw missing in it um, and those who have been pushing um, to see this come uh, come to the floor and come to a vote. So I'm glad for the public hearing and I'm grateful. Um, I am concerned about um, this latest draft of this um, uh, of this proposal because each draft we see it getting a little bit weaker in terms of protecting um, renters and I um, so the second between the previous draft and this one we have lost the um, the the part that talked about getting get, um, giving information to those who have been denied why they have been denied and um, particularly the screening service that was used so that they can follow up and they can find out what was wrong and how to fix it and I know I've I've experienced that with people who, once they figure out exactly what's wrong, were able to go back to a previous landlord or, and, and fix it so they could get apartment the next time. So that's really criti critical piece. Um, and the, re the other reason I want to speak about that tonight is that seeing this draft change and hearing the conversation this morning, hearing about how one of the 
major conversation partners in this um, in, in this final draft um, is uh, Clay Powell from the RPOA gives me pause and gives me concern. Um, we're talking about a man who is looking out for the interests of landlords and landlords looking out for the interests of landlords is the reason that we have this ordinance to begin with, that, that we're in this mess. And the people who are actually um, experts at what would be needed to um, be protected by an ordinance like this are people who are seeking housing, are people who are renting, who are people who are not homeowners or are not property owners and who really need um, to, to, to have a system that's going to be fair and simple. Um, so that's why I reached out to Eric DeLong, because I feel that if the conversation partners around the table are going to be landlords instead of residents, that isn't fair. The residents of this city deserve a place at the table for conversation and not just three minutes behind the microphone at a public hearing. So I'm eager for our meeting on Thursday, Eric, and I hope that you can let us know the different people that you have been connecting with who are residents in this city that helped you make this final draft. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your input. All right, others who wish to be heard on items that we're voting on tonight? Uh, Jim Howe, Kirsten Neighborhood Association. Uh, I'm in the neighborhood. Well, I do membership for the Neighborhood Association, so I guess that too. <laughs> um, I had the opportunity to come to the meeting this morning, and um, it's much like a baseball game. When you're there live, it's a lot more interesting than just watching it on uh, Facebook Live. Um, and I was glad to be there because I got to see the reaction from the commissioners when, um, when it was introduced. And the reaction was, unfortunately, not a good one. The commissioners seemed very confused at why things were struck in out of this ordinance and why um, the RPOA, for example, was consulted. Um, so there's a lot of conversation, I think, at the commission level that still needs to be had over what this ordinance is going to look like. Um, I don't know how a uh, refining process works. Um, it looks to me like any part that was obligated to a landlord was just deleted out. And for example, in your new ordinance, number four, sites number four, instead of, because it used to be number five, but now it's number four. And then in the last paragraph, you say they have 16, 60 days to hold your check, but they need to give it back 14 days after the application. So you contradict yourself in your own ordinance and you cite your own paragraph in your own ordinance. Um, and that makes me concerned that we are not spending the time to look at this to make sure that it's achieving its goal. I believe this morning, as mentioned by commissioners, some of the things that we were expecting to see was a cap in there, an actual dollar figure amount um, that's done in other cities around the United States. If the commission needs that information, Grand Rapids Homes for All could provide some examples. Um, it, we also expected tenants to know why they've been denied and who they denied them. And that important information is really important because, for example, when the Housing Commission was up there this morning talking about their Rent and Ready program, they said they would need to know why someone was denied and who the, the denying company was. So unless the Housing Commission is just expecting to run free background checks on, and rental history checks on everyone that comes in, that information could be provided by the landlord when they reject them. So there's, I, I suggest we go back to the original draft that was brought forward. It's still on the committee, uh, the Housing Now policy website. If you click number 11 and then click the link, you'll get the original draft. And look at the last section of number two and all of number three on that original draft. And you'll see every obligation that was for the landlord has been taken out of this new one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right, others who wish to be heard? I usually just speak off the top. I'm Martha Cooper. I've been coming for quite a while. I'm sure many of you know me by now. Um, I just actually got here a little late. 
because I was over at the food truck helping somebody get food. Um, so I come to talk to you about what's on the ground because my colleagues in Thomas for All have done a pretty good job of referring to all of the meat. Um, I got up this morning, went to that meeting, and I was just blown away. First, I guess, since it's mine for three minutes, I'd like to suggest that interim city manager um, not be appointed as city manager because that was not anywhere where I would like to see my city going. I want to tell you that I've canvassed with our organization some neighborhoods, and I have heard people talk about the man upstairs got $200 raised on his rent. Okay, that's, that's over there in the northeast end. It's usually really low income. And the, and the man's telling me that, and he's downstairs with two little, it's not those little cute boys, and they're moving tonight. I had a friend out in Kentwood and telling me their rent got raised $100 because there's nothing affordable out there. You all have really dragged your feet and not been very in genuine about getting anything done about putting any kind of affordable housing. So all of the problems that are out there are because there's no place to go. There's nothing affordable. When, we, when I heard that from the Housing Commission guy got up this morning, I was just flabbergasted. Rent ready. We're talking about people that don't make enough to rent the apartments that are out there. They don't make enough, even if they were making 12 an hour on the regular. We're talking about people living in hotels now for a year. Okay, I'm almost out of time. When I was a painter, I used to go and do estimates. It was the cost of doing business. It took me my time, my gas, and my expertise. I don't know any other business where you pay to buy their product. I understand that every homeowner and property owner and investment has to be protected, and that's their cost of doing business. It's like someone on the street, they have a rent, they have insurance for their house, they have insurance for their business. I don't understand how come that man that told me I had $300 in application fees before I found this place, that was on Warden, Warden in the southeast side. And you want to sit there and have no cap? And you want to talk about rent readiness? I'm talking about, I came from the food truck. People are going there because they're working and can't afford their rent. Now, we need somebody representing the people who are really struggling in this town. You have had a slow crisis and nobody has called the fire department. It is not you guys being genuine at all. The affordable housing fund should have been up first, and this one is not going to get solved because that did not get done. Be honest. Thank you. All right, others who wish to be heard? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to close this public hearing. Oh. Good evening. Good evening, fellow citizens. This is the House of the People, City Hall's House of the People. Watchdog Miller reporting. Uh, the agenda, we're going getting back to the uh, comic book agenda. Uh, no dollar figures on, uh, well, let's see, B2, uh, C1, 27467, uh, D1, and, and D9, no dollar figures. I'd, I'd also like to see on each, every single motion who, made the motion originally and who supported it. You go back centuries here and to the proceedings of uh, Common Council and so on, uh, they were always there. Also, third, not just a motion, but who's driving it? Who's behind all these, these resolutions? Uh, well, we can say, well, Mr. Holdrup is, 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 is uh, just write it off as a freshman, freshman. I try to get away with freshman mistakes myself, but I mean, Mr. Holdrup uh, is not getting a freshman salary. Uh, why wasn't Mindy considered the hardest worker in, in, uh, in that office in the first place? Uh, on uh, uh, D1, uh, 19, it should never have been stolen from the Oakdale neighborhood in the first place. Uh, rise was down 70% the first year after you sold it, put it on Michigan, then 60%. I see Michigan also uh, uh, elsewhere on the Michigan corridor. Uh, no flags there, okay? Uh, aside from our Sulawitz and uh, uh, one bar in, in a veteran's place and Dramatic, which is skipping town Dramatic, no flags there. Why, why are all of this uh, uh, aid for that Michigan corridor? On the 19, the route I proposed brought before you many times is far better, okay? Uh, 
This guy in the Chamber of Commerce knew it. He's a white sheep uh, uh, bigot. He's, uh, his organization has kept uh, Catholic and black routes out from our own city hall uh, for years. And he, he is endorsing the 19. You did deserve a, a full hearing just on the 19 itself, and, uh, uh, which uh, my proposal for that quarter is way better. I've been working on it years, but the rapid never considered it, nor uh, Spectrum Health, nor uh, Spectrum's ridership is maybe some 14,000 employees in the uh, metro, uh, maybe some 200 you can go a, a day, 200 round trips a day. They get it for free, they still won't, uh, they still won't ride the, the rapid, even though uh, the, vice, the vice chairman of the rapid uh, is, is a big shot at, at Spectrum. So that's why the 19 is, is, is is uh, stolen from the Oakdale neighborhood and is running Michigan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in terms of White, uh, it was Hanoi Hartwell who appointed White in the first place. Uh, and I support the first two speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. All right, any final comments on items that we're voting on tonight? Hi, welcome. Hi. Um, Public speaking is not my forte, so I'm just going to read what I have written here. Uh, my name is Dana Kennedy. I'm um, a Grand Rapids citizen from living in the first ward. Um, I'm speaking to you regarding the rental application fee ordinance tonight. A lot of what I have to say you probably already heard, but I think it's important enough to hear again. Um, in the newly drafted version of the proposal, it does not require landlords to report to the applicant the reason for the denial, if so. Um, and it's also... Um, doesn't have to reveal the information relating to the screening agency or the credit check agency um, that was used during the process of the application. This creates a huge barrier for the applicant to try to obtain housing again. Um, if the reason for the denial is reported to the applicant and it is due to a reason that they may be able to fix or improve in, they would be aware of that for the next time they want to apply. The new version of the proposal also does not require landlords to disclose their actual costs for screening if the applicant asks. Requiring the, land, the landlords to disclose their costs is what will keep them accountable when charging applicants. This way for the applicants um, to feel safe when applying for housing and do not have to worry about being taken advantage of by landlords. In addition, this new draft, like the original draft, does not require um, landlords to charge um, a cap on their application fees and just as much as they pay for the screenings. Um, Grand Rapids is obviously going through a housing crisis right now. And when the application fees are obnoxiously high, applicants are spending most of their money on these fees, um, don't have enough money for the down payments or the first month's rent, or they just don't have enough money to apply for the housing whatsoever. Um, application fees are continual barriers, barriers for those searching for housing, and not capping the fee at a certain cost heightens those barriers and increases the housing crisis in Grand Rapids. I am advocating for a full ban on the rental application fees but we'll sell for no less than a rental application ordinance that stops landlords from profiting from rental application fees and protects residents from being denied without being told why. Please take all of this into account and think about the effect that these new changes to the proposal could have in our community. Housing should be a right, not a privilege, and as people who have the power to make change, it is your responsibility to advocate for those who do not. Thank you, Dana. All right, any final comments before I close this opportunity for public comment? Hi, my name is Joyce Daniels, and I don't have a long thing to say. I just want to let it be known that I am so sorry that this amendment for the application fee was changed. Um, I look at the people who apply for um, housing who already have, have a problem. I know you guys have probably heard this in the last five minutes a lot, but it's so important. Um, my personal story is back in the day, I didn't have to worry about application fees. I didn't have to, have to worry about a lot of things because I had good credit and because of the company that I worked for. Nowadays, it's not the case. It doesn't matter. Um, there was a gentleman that moved here, and I say gentleman, he was a kid. He was 18. He moved here in order to help his mother, who was unable to help herself, and he applied for an applicant. He applied for an apartment not understanding he's never lived by himself, what it entailed. Um, making minimum wage, he was spending more money on application fees than he would have even on a first month's rent. Um, in Grand Rapids, that's a lot. And he couldn't understand why he was not getting the apartment. Um, they need to know why. 
they can't help themselves if they can't figure out what the answer is. So I just wanted to let my opinion be known and personal story. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Joyce. All right, anyone else who wishes to be heard on items that we're voting on tonight? Robert Mesker, uh, East Grand Rapids, Michigan, but primarily 312 Prospect Avenue Northeast. I just felt compelled to address the uh, application ordinance just because I don't see any landlords represented here, so maybe I thought I'd mention how reasonable I think some of these are. I have always uh, explained the disposition of an application uh, to uh, applicants, uh, and I've always taken the application fee and applied it 100% in full to their security deposit. So there was, as far as the application fee goes, some of us take it as just a cost of doing business. So it's pretty reasonable. And I think, I haven't read the, the details of the changes, so I, I guess I, I'm at a loss. But uh, if, if there is an explanation of how that fee is disposed of, I think it's proper for people to do that. And I guess I don't know why all landlords don't do it the way I do, but I can't speak for everyone else. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Robert. All right, anyone else who wishes to be heard? Okay, I'm gonna close that opportunity for public comment and that will take us to approval of minutes from our last meeting, which was on May 22nd. Can I get a motion? Support. All right, commissioners, any questions, comments, additions, changes? All right, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, it carries. All right, next that will take us to petitions and communications. First one, communication from Mary Swanson regarding their resignation from the Smart Zone Local Development Finance Authority. That is referred to Committee on Appointments. And a communication received from the residents of Riverhouse Condominiums regarding the possibility of replacing a mid-block pedestrian crosswalk on Bridge Street between Monroe and Scribner. And that is received and filed. All right, next that will take us to reports of city officers and we have three items tonight. The city manager submitted the report of bond sale sanitary sewer system series 2018 bonds. That is received and filed. Comptroller's report for the period of May 16, 2018 through May 29, 2018 in the amount of $12,412,417.65. That is received and filed. And the treasurer's report for the period of May 15, 2018 through May 24, 2018. And that is also received and filed. So next that will take us to our consent agenda and reports from our standing committee meetings. So earlier today, the city commission had a number of standing committee meetings and in those meetings, we talked about a number of, of items and we voted on those. And all of the items that we voted on unanimously are part of the consent agenda. So tonight with one voice vote, we'll adapt those items. So can I get a motion for the consent agenda? Close. Support. All right, commissioners, anything to add? It's been with quite a marathon of meetings today. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, it carries. All right, next that will take us to ordinances to be adopted, and we have a number of ordinances before us tonight, so we'll get started with the first one. Ordinance amending section one of the budget ordinance 2017-36 for fiscal year 2018, amendment number 21. All right, can I get a motion? So moved. Support. All right, uh, let's see. Commissioner Kelly, you wanna tell us about this? Yes, um, I'm filling in for Commissioner Allen tonight, and this is uh, a list of things that um, happened this morning in the budget uh, fiscal committee. There was a public library department, Michigan Department of Education grant in the amount of $50,000 that was received. Um, our, community, our community's children through Heart of Mich West Michigan United Way grant, they received $95,000. And that was it, leaving, uh, this will authorize an increase of 95,000 in the estimated revenue and appropriations of the other grants fund. And that was it, short agenda. All right, commissioners, any uh, questions about that? All right, this is a roll call vote tonight. Commissioner O'Connor. Yes. Commissioner Ruppert. Yes. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. Commissioner Lanier? Yes. Mayor Bliss? Yes. And can I get a motion to give this immediate effect? Swift. Support. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, it carries. All right, that will take us to our second ordinance. Ordinance amending chapter 103 of title seven of the city code entitled amusements. Can I get a motion? Swift. Support. All right, Commissioner Repart, you wanna tell us about this? 
Yes, so we're, there's a lot of codes that are being repealed. This one is related to amusement devices and eliminates the need for amusement owners and operators to obtain licensing. Thank you. And this is a roll call vote tonight. Commissioner Ruppert? Yes. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. Commissioner Lanier? Yes. Commissioner O'Connor? Yes. Mayor Bliss? Yes. And can I get a motion to give this immediate effect? So moved to support. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? It carries. That'll take us to our third ordinance. Ordinance repealing Chapter 107 of Title 7 of the City Code entitled Coin Operated Laundries. So moved. Support. All right, Commissioner Kelly. Yes, this repeals in its entirety Chapter 107 Coin Operated Laundries of Title 7 Licensing and Regulation. And it's another one of our licenses that um, we are repealing. All right, any questions, Commissioners? All right, this is a roll call vote. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. Commissioner Lanier? Yes. Commissioner O'Connor? Yes. Commissioner Ruppert? Yes. Mayor Bliss? Yes. And can I give a motion to give this immediate effect? So moved. Support. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, it carries. All right, that'll take us to our fourth ordinance tonight. Ordinance repealing Chapter 108 of Title 7 of the City Code entitled Coin Operated Car Washes. All so right. move. Support. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lanier, you wanna tell us about this? Yes, Mayor, this is another one of the um, city clerk's office um, ordinances that they are repealing. Um, so those who own coin operated car washes no longer need to receive license through the city. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is another roll call of it. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. Commissioner Lanier? Yes. Commissioner O'Connor? Yes. Commissioner Ruppert? Yes. Everybody? Mayor and Bliss. me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and can I get a motion to give this immediate effect? So moved. Support. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? It carries. All right. Bear with us. We have a few more of these. Uh, so this uh, next one, I'll turn to our city clerk. Ordinance repealing Chapter 105 of Title 7 of the city code entitled Motor, Motor Vehicle Rental Agency. All right. Can I get a motion? So, support. All right, moved and supported. Commissioner O'Connor, anything to add to this? No, ma'am. All right, this is also a roll call vote. Commissioner Lanier? Yes. Commissioner O'Connor? Yes. Commissioner Ruppert? Yes. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. Mayor Bliss? Yes, and can I get a motion to give it immediate effect? So moved. Support. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? It carries. All right, that'll take us to our sixth ordinance tonight. Ordinance repealing Chapter 106 of Title 7 of the City Code entitled Ambulance. So move. Support. Support. All right. Uh, Commissioner Kelly, anything to add? Uh, yes, this just uh, repeals. I, I do want to say that we have a police officer who was doing AmbuCab on the weekends, and he brought this to my attention some time ago, hoping that we would repeal it because he's already licensed by the state. So uh, we're opening ourselves to do business here in Grand Rapids and yeah. removing some fees. Thank you. And for the audience members, we talked about this a couple weeks ago at our I had a commission meeting. Um, the city clerk's office has been going through obsolete or redundant licenses and making the recommendation to repeal them. So that's what this list is, is related to. Uh, it, it's been on our list for a long time to actually go through old ordinances and rules and start to clean those up. So that's what you're, what you're witnessing tonight. Um, so with that, this is also a roll call vote. Commissioner Lanier? Yes. Commissioner O'Connor? Yes. Commissioner Ruppert? Yes. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. Mayor Bliss? Yes. And can I get a motion to give this immediate effect? So moved. Support. Support. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? It carries. All right. That'll take us to item number seven. Ordinance amending chapter 92 of title seven of the city code entitled fees and bonds required. All right. Can I get a motion? So moved. Support. All right. Commissioner Ruppert, anything to add? Yeah, so we approved a motion or a resolution a few weeks ago, and this just removes the license fee categories, which are no longer required by the city code. All right, thank you. All right, this is a roll call vote. Commissioner O'Connor? Yes. Commissioner Ruppert? Yes. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. Commissioner Lanier? Yes. Mayor Bliss? Yes. And can I get a motion to give this immediate effect? So moved. Support. Support. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? It carries. All right, that'll take us to item number eight. Ordinance repealing and replacing chapter 114 of title seven of the city code entitled pedicabs. So moved. Support. All right, Commissioner Lanier, anything to add on this? Nothing to add. All right, this is a roll call vote. 
Commissioner Ruppert? Yes. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. Commissioner Lanier? Yes. Commissioner O'Connor? Yes. Mayor Bliss? Yes. And can I get a motion to give this immediate effect? So moved. Support. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? It carries. All right, that will take us to our ninth ordinance tonight, which is not a repeal of an ordinance. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, City Clerk, you want to read that? Ordinance repealing and replacing, sorry, ordinance rezoning, sorry, <laughs> that's your program. Ordinance rezoning 1046, 1052, 1058 Edmond Avenue Northeast and 740, 742, and 754 Hubert Avenue Northeast to TN-LDR, which is a traditional neighborhood, low density residential. All right, can I get a motion? So oh, moved. Support. All right, Commissioner Kelly, you want to tell us about this? Yes, this is combining six properties that have a land area of less than an acre in the city. Both the Edmond Avenue and Hubert Street frontages of these properties are called paper streets because they're platted streets that have never been improved. Because the properties have no frontage on an improved street, the developer of the properties will have to construct a driveway from the street on his own dime for access and have all utilities extended to the properties. Although a specific development plan is not under consideration, the applicant has submitted an exhibit showing the location of the proposed driveway and residence. So uh, this is gonna change the zoning to allow some additional building in the city. Yeah, thank you. And commissioners, we had a public hearing on this uh, on May 22nd. Uh, so you may recall the details from that public hearing. Uh, so any questions or comments? It's pretty straightforward. Yeah, and there was overall resident support for this. So I was kind of surprised. It's kind of a hidden away little area, but mm -hmm. apparently this is going to work. All right, So good, thank you. All right, this is a roll call vote tonight. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. Commissioner Lanier? Yes. Commissioner O'Connor? Yes. Commissioner Rubber? Yes. Mayor Bliss? Yes. All right, that'll take us to our 10th ordinance tonight. Miscellaneous Zoning Ordinance Text Amendments to Correct Omissions and Errors. So moved. Support. Support. All right, and uh, oh, Commissioner O'Connor, you want to tell us about this, or would you like Suzanne Schultz to come forward? And I can just talk real brief if you want. It's uh, in 2017, the city adopted a rewrite of the 2008 Zoning Ordinance. Since that time, uh, planning staff has identified some items that need clarification or modification just for the ease and interpretation of uh, enforcement. Great, thank you. Are you coming forward in case we have questions? All right, so commissioners, any uh, questions about these items? I have one question. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> Since you came all the way up here, Suzanne. <laughs> yeah. So we did have an email about the child care uh, change, yes. uh, the 24 hours. Can you talk a little bit about that and why that would be changed? We've, um, we've only had several uh, child care requests and the Planning Commission has a history of approving all of them. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen a change in child care um, probably in the past three years where we're seeing more extended longer hours to accommodate families that have parents who work second and third shift. Mm -hmm. And so this would allow that as well as expanding the kind of definition of group living in certain areas of the city. So what we're trying to do and you'll see a future amendment in probably a month um, that also examines this okay. as we're trying to understand group living a little bit better as well as care facilities. The um, amendment the Planning Commission is going to be considering in, a, in next week has to do with adult care okay. um, because we're just finding that that's a real community need that we're mm -hmm. seeing and that we need to accommodate that in the ordinance. Okay. All right, I look forward to that information yeah. coming up. Yeah, thank you. Commissioners, any other questions? All right, this is a roll call vote tonight. Commissioner Lanier? Commissioner O'Connor? Yes. Commissioner Rupper? Yes. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. Mayor Bliss? Yes. All right, and that will take us to our last ordinance. Zoning ordinance text amendments relative to the sale of alcohol for off-premise consumption. So moved. All right. Just to get it on the floor. But yeah, thank, thank you, because I thought it was just up for discussion tonight and it wasn't a vote. That's what I was going to say, and I thought yeah. it should have come to Cal before it came to the I, night meeting. Yeah, so. I thought so too. And, it, so. and in light of, well, let's, let's have a conversation, uh, and then um, potentially one of you will make a motion to um, postpone. Post Okay. My understanding was it would be for discussion. So um, the, the reason it wasn't on cow is because you had such a full agenda uh, earlier today and, and we've gotten stuck on this conversation a couple times. So um, that was the reason for 
having it for discussion this evening. Um, and so just so we have a little bit more time to focus in on it with the other expectations that you have. Um, the, what we provided in our memo is what was originally proposed by the City Commission. Then we also outlined what the Planning Commission changed um, in their recommendations, specifically the um, concentration requirements. Uh, they eliminated all uh, concentration of licenses requirements in the ordinance. Um, they did look at hours of operation and director review is appropriate for establishments maintaining current approved hours of operation. Um, this planning commission modified that so closing is at midnight any day of the week. Um, and then the planning commission did add drug and alcohol rehabilitation facilities to the proximity requirement. Um, and that was based on neighborhood input, specifically from uh, NECA, after having the liquor store approved on Fuller, just south of Leonard, uh, at the old 7-Eleven location. So um, they had gotten feedback that a separation distance from drug and alcohol rehab facilities was, re was desired. And so they did include that in their requirements from a separation distance standpoint. But looking at concentration was something that the Planning Commission recommended against. Um, so the ordinance in front of you is what the Planning Commission changes. Um, it have been incorporated into the ordinance under consideration, and then uh, we figured that you would want to talk about those. I do know that discussions occurred with the Chamber of Commerce and um, a major constituent of theirs. The Planning Department met with them early on before they talked to the neighborhoods and to the Commission, so we're not sure what the content of the discussion was. was. I know there was concern about the Good Neighbor Plan, and um, whether or not that was too rigorous of a requirement to, to place on a small business, particularly around loitering. Uh, and they were concerned that they were making them uh, accountable for people who are loitering outside of their business when we don't have a loitering or ordinance that we enforce. Uh, so that was a concern. Um, and then just kind of some of the, the um, healthy corner store requirements, although in our evaluation of their stores, which they had not gone through, um, the thought was that they would, that the good neighbor, or I'm sorry, the, the healthy corner store would apply. We did include in the definition section of the ordinance a healthy corner store uh, description uh, to Commissioner Kelly's concern that describes what the expectations for that would be, and that is based off of input received from the Kent County Health Department. So, I'm, I'll just open it up for discussion. I know we've, I think most of us have had quite a few conversations about this. And uh, I know one thing I've heard, which is another topic that we're talking about around this table, is that the core concern is around enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so I'm just gonna open it up for discussion. And then um, I do think that this is a conversation we probably should have around COW. And uh, so we can talk about process and next steps mm -hmm. after that. But uh, commissioners, do, uh, why don't we start with questions or comments? Uh, I'll just open it up. So, Commissioner O'Connor. Uh, yeah, so I appreciate the, the recommendations from the Planning Commission. I think there's still some things that I'm, I'm still a bit unclear about as it relates to this, especially, uh, you know, in practice, how this really works um, to get an administrative approval. And if the, if the intent of our going through this maturation of policy to try to figure out how we do this better to make it more streamlined and you know, if, if it happens all the time, you know, like you said about the last ordinance, things that we that typically get approved 100% of the time, why does that become a special end use? I still feel like the, the path to success for this is extremely narrow in scope and really doesn't change the way in which we conduct uh, approvals for this stuff. Um, I think just a couple of the, the items, especially are the, the I, know, I think I made the recommendation to actually take the distance out further from 300 to 500 to match what MLCC requires you to, to notify a church or a school, which makes perfect sense. But the idea that you have to be 500 feet from a residential zoning district means that any of our traditional business corridors don't apply because residential zoning, I mean, most of our, our commercial lots are 100 to 150 feet deep. And so in any traditional business corridor that you wanted to make an application, it would have to be special end use anyway, so it doesn't really make sense. Um, uh, I, I really st still struggle with this healthy corner store thing. I just you know, I, I don't think that's the business of the city to be looking into, you know, are you selling eggs or cheese or, you know, I guess cheese is debatable if it's healthy or not, um, or, or groceries or lettuce or whatever that, that ends up being. I don't, I, it's not, that's not, I don't think that's the core business of the city and something that we're charged by charter to have to monitor is what, 
what people sell in their store. I understand having a mix of you know alcohol versus other things. That that makes sense. That's that's pretty typical. But I, whether or not you uh, you decide to sell food items as part of your business, you know, again, I think brought up the example of places like Art of the Table or Sicilianos that don't typically they're not they're not food destinations, but they don't part of the, you know less than 50% of the business I bet is alcohol. And so it's, it's you know, I, think, I think any one of us would, would welcome a business like that into one of our neighborhood business districts. Um, I do a wholeheartedly agree with the idea of this from the Good Neighbor Plan. I, I, I think there's really some good merits about the Good Neighbor Plan, um, but I also really struggle with this loitering and trespassing thing. If, if, you know, if my guys over there in blue can, gals in blue over there can't enforce uh, loitering or trespassing because city ordinance doesn't allow it, how can we put that onus on a a business owner to then have to monitor and regulate who stands outside your business uh, if, if I don't have the support of uh, my men and women in uniform to help me control that situation because obviously sometimes those situations can be you know unruly and untenable and so I, I just don't think, think that that should be something that should be included in it. Um, yeah, I think that was, that was most of the big ones. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Kelly, did you have your hand up? No, but I can certainly speak. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we know that. I thought I saw your we hand. <laughs> no pressure. I know we're all going to be doing that. Yeah, I too think that we need to do a little bit more um, work on this. Uh, I too have the concerns about the loitering. We've The trespassing issue, I know that was an ACLU issue too. Where are we with that, Suzanne? Okay. Yeah. Nita has any comment? I know that there was some people can write letter or have a letter on file. We still have that available, correct? Right. Okay, so. Yeah, that's pretty much taken care of. We have a okay, and we do have a process, so maybe it is something, but I think that needs to be clear in order for us to make decisions about it. You know, the trespassing letters. Mm -hmm. So if that's what we mean by loitering, so again, to, to Commissioner O'Connor's point, I think we've got to clarify that, what that means. Um, I like the idea of the healthy food. I'm willing to debate well, that. And, and remember, it's not just fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables because, you know, you can get a can of corn or whatever bottled <laughs> you water. need that's bottled water, for ex example. And I think most stores do have that. Um, maybe we, we need to do a little research on, on that if there are stores out there. But I tell you, most con convenience stores I go into do have a fair amount of food. The, and I think the concern, though, is we have observed a number of stores in the city switching to all alcohol, mm. where it's floor to ceiling, they've gotten rid of all of their food inventory and even their snack inventory, mm -hmm. and it's simply all alcohol mm -hmm. with mixers. Um, there's, a, there's a store over by the development center that did that, and there's a couple other locations I could cite that um, it's oh, no longer I mean, a party true. store where it, you, know, you can get a mix of things. It's one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think how we've defined corner stores in the past or, or party stores and, and what they've been used for is changing. Uh -huh. And this was to help kind of define that a little bit better. Right, right. Well, I, I like this one. Um, I, I just don't want to waste a lot of time tonight if we're going to review this later. But I do think it will be helpful for Suzanne to know what our questions are so she can answer them. That's why I asked about the definition of healthy food. Um, the, I like, actually I really liked this chart that you gave us before. I thought it was one of the most clear charts for one thing. And I do have concerns about the distance because that's really what brought this all up in the, in the first place. Enforcement, I agree, but I think again we need to explore how is that going to happen. Uh, Commissioner O'Connor brought up some ideas today around yep. a, a police officer that we could explore that more thoroughly. But I'd want to hear from the chief about that as well. So I'm not sure uh, that this is the venue tonight. Yeah, yeah I, um, thank you. Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Lennon? I'll make mine brief. Um, I, I agree with Commissioner Kelly that I really like the chart, Suzanne. Okay. It would be great um, when we do have it on the agenda the, agenda the next time, if you could um, include where we were before it went to the Planning Commission too, because it, then it'll kind of tell that story at a glance. Um, so do we have to dig up all of that history, and which some of us probably will, but if we don't, at least it's in front of us. Yeah, and, they are, um, I, I that. and following up on that, I think two charts, one before in one, in one that the Planning Commission has that look like this would make it easiest well, to I compare. Think, I think, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Park? 
Yeah, I, I just uh, say a couple of quick things. I, I came today ready to wrestle this one out and make a decision. I, <laughs> I, I, I was ready. I like made notes and everything. <laughs> well, you can share those. Uh, I mean, if you want to wrestle, we. You know. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, very similar. You know, we just opened up a fresh market on Fulton in partnership with Access of West Michigan. When I did research on the healthy corner stores, it's really hard. none of the examples that I found were regulated by the city. They were all nonprofit initiatives, the YMCA, places like Access. So I, I do have a hard time regulating that from a city standpoint, even though I want it yeah. in my neighborhood. Um, and then I think that uh, with regards to uh, the Good Neighbor Plan, my main concern is that they are responsible for reaching out to the Neighborhood Association, having a conversation, having a clear dictation of who to call if there's a problem. Uh, that's the main concern I have, but I do think it's hard for enforcement of loitering. Um, trespassing, I think that we have a, a recourse from the city, but loitering is, is tricky. The Bridge Street Market is going to open on Fulton Street, or on Bridge Street. We, my staff just heard a presentation from them, and they're going to have doors open. You know, people are going to be able to walk in and out, and uh, you know, some of their, it's going to make it very challenging if, uh, if that onus falls completely on them. So. I think that um, yeah, those are the, the things that I that I care about with this. I, d I want them to make sure I want to make sure that they communicate with the neighborhood association. And while I would love for them to have healthy food, I'm not entirely sure that we can regulate that. But yeah, yeah, thank you. And I, um, I I'll, I'll add a couple things, and then I do think that we should make a decision on on next steps and when to discuss this next. Um, you know. I'm concerned about unintended consequences, and I think we've all heard from um, individuals and businesses who want to open up grocery stores or something similar, but also have beer and wine sales. And uh, you know, I'm very concerned about having an unintended negative consequence, and so I want to think through that. The other, the other two pieces I think are important is exactly that Commissioner Rapart is having that contact information uh, when there are issues, and then also. Um, I, I liked the recommendation around doing a crime prevention analysis, environmental scan, and really looking at crime prevention. You know, some of the core, I'm always trying to think of like, what are the core problems we're trying to solve and what are the issues that we heard from the community and from our neighborhoods? And they're largely around crime, crime prevention. Um, and then also when there's a problem, how do we make sure that we're able to solve it? And then enforcement. Uh, so when I sat down with a number of neighbors, the, the big concern was enforcement and the concern of having additional licenses approved when there's already problems with current establishments and there's no enforcement. And so I think that enforcement conversation is really key. Um, and, and, that's, and that we talked about it this morning, in my opinion, that needs to be a priority. So, um, Commissioner O'Connor. I, I just, after uh, finding some fine print here, I just, I, my, my uh, comments about the distance, uh, I, I do see got changed to the linear frontage along a primary street. I do, I apologize. I thought I did not see that down in the. We, we heard you. I know, but I just, it's <laughs> like, it's down there. It's I, in there. It's in the fine print. <laughs> it's in red, though. I should have stood out to you. So, um, so Commissioners, the next steps. We could bring this back. Uh, Suzanne, do you want to speak to that? What timing? Yeah. Okay. I think I think there's there's really two two issues. One is if you're comfortable with the planning commission proceeding with approving licenses or reviewing licenses as they're as they're being requested now that that half mile rule has been rescinded by the Michigan Liquor Control Commission. That's a big decision point related to the sale of liquor um, that this tried to address. If you're okay with that, if you're okay with uh, business as usual and understanding that that rule has been lifted and you might get a couple liquor stores maybe less than a half mile from one another, um, the question to me is then do you want to wait until the SEPTED ordinance that we've discussed in the budget review comes and then we kind of review this again to see if that addresses the enforcement issues that you've identified and is a different avenue or a different approach than through zoning specifically with separation distance requirements and other things that you're dealing with it from the enforcement standpoint through the police powers versus through zoning. So it's a little bit of a different kind of tact yeah. at looking at how we, how we deal with this particular yeah. use. I think that's a, that's a good question. My initial 
kind of gut responses is I think that they need to be tied together, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, the overwhelming feedback I received was around enforcement and even if some of these changes were put in place, it still wouldn't solve the problems that have been brought to our table. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I think, per, and I'll look to my colleagues to see if you agree or not, I think those should be tied together. The, the, Mayor, I do, I agree with that. Um, Suzanne, remind me, after the moratorium was lifted, we had a conversation about um, the Planning Commission as they're considering applications that um, you would inform them of the will of the commission and then they would take whatever action kind of based on where we were. And then we've had, you know, this go before them and there have been additional conversations. So where are we now with how they're considering them? We are trying to work in some of the conditions of approval that uh, are contained within this ordinance. So as they're reviewing a special land use, if they're applicable, we've been trying to bring in, for example, required septed review. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they, I mean, they are an entity as a commission unto themselves. Mm -hmm. So staff can make recommendations. Whether or not they choose to use staff recommendations is, is a, yeah, another issue. Um, or city commission recommendations for that matter. So I would say kind of as a, a relative success rate as far as what you've kind of as the city commission desired to have done at the planning commission level and what staff has been recommending on potential conditions that would be in line with this, it's, it's not 100%. Um, I'd probably say it's better than 50%, but you do have some variability depending on the request from the applicant and the location. Do we have a great number of those in the hopper? We have seen the number reduce. Uh, we did have, uh, we're now seeing dollar stores, family dollar stores in particular coming through requesting for beer and wine sales. Um, we've had four what? different locations. Family dollar? Uh-huh. They and have fresh food. It, they, were, they were, in fact, selling beer and wine before they had local <laughs> approvals. I'm, I'm about to see um, but they... <laughs> Um, so they, and according to the Family Dollar guy, not just the four eight stores they just requested, but they're coming in with probably at least a half dozen more. And they have quite a few, I don't know how many, but they have quite a few stores in, in the city. Yeah. yeah, and I think my understanding is that is happening statewide. So um, when do you think we will have, when do you think we'll be, what's the length of time that we would be considering this? If we didn't just postpone it until the next meeting, when are you thinking that we'll be able to have the joint conversation then? Well, if you had, I mean, according to your schedule, I mean, it would either be next meeting, which is next Tuesday, or July 10th would be the soonest, yeah. uh, based on your calendar, uh, that we could have the discussion. Yeah, and uh, next uh, next week with the budget, we, we may want to hold off. Not have anything. I'm gonna, yeah. Can I say, can I chime in? This is outside. Yes, this, please. Is, this is a little yeah. crazy for me. I, I mean, we could we could just pass this now as it is, so that we have something in place. I mean, there's a lot of good in here. I think we all agree that there's a lot of good in, in here. And then we can work to figure out the changes that we need to make later. I mean, yeah, I'm the this guy is that was, crazy I'm, of you. I'm the guy in the morning <laughs> that was saying we need to make some decisions, so let's make some decisions. Um, right. let, let's accept the Planning Commission changes as they're written. And if we need to go back and modify some things, I mean, that's in our purview to do. And well, that, that is an option. Um, Put it out there, guys. <laughs> Commissioners, I will, I will turn to my colleague. That, that is definitely an option uh, because we could obviously go back and make amendments. Um, yeah, I'm, you, not, I'm not crazy about going back and making an am amendments. I do have some concerns about hours of operation in the half-mile rule. And I think that's one of the sticking points, the concentration that we heard from neighborhoods, along with, like you say, the enforcement issue. So... Um, I, I want to continue to discuss that, and I know that Commissioner Jones would like to have, be part of that conversation, and he's not here tonight. Yeah. All right. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion. Okay. Um, I move that we postpone this discussion to um, Committee of the Whole. Yeah. Hold on one second. Mm -hmm. We have a motion on the floor to approve. Mm -hmm. So oh. we, 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 could we could just have the original ma maker which was Commissioner With, Kelly, just withdraw. Just withdraw, and then we can. You don't have yeah. to make a motion to postpone it. Mm -hmm. Then there's no action. Yeah, mm -hmm. as long as the as long as the body agrees to the the request for withdrawal. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. That's probably I, cleaner. It's cleaner than I don't have two motions to worry about. Beautiful. <laughs> okay. Happy to. Thank you, I'm, City Clerk. So I would like to withdraw. Streamline. The okay. Should, should make a request. Okay. So Commissioner, can you say that again? 
I would like to just withdraw the motion. Is so, there a support? Don't have the support. Just everybody, just shake their head if they. Do. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. We we don't do that very often. Well, as long as it's not an so, objection. Everyone, any objections? Thank you. Any objections to withdrawing the motion? Okay. Seeing none. Um, we're going to withdraw this item, and it'll come back um, to the commission at a later date. Is there a specific date that you would like it to come back? Why don't you give us a sense of how much time you need for the enforcement piece? If you would just email the commission and oh. give us a sense. So you would like to see the SEPTED piece with this? I, I would. Mm -hmm. I, I think it would be good to know what would it take. You know, if, yeah. if that gets us into August, September, then maybe not. So right. just, yeah. Let's it, see it will be, you'll be into September. Okay, then mm, no, yeah. we probably need to July. Yeah, July yeah, 10. We'll mm. Bring it. <clears throat> maybe the second meeting in July? Okay. Just for discussion, and then I could probably give you an outline and a framework of what the subtitle ordinance might look like. Okay. So at least it gives you a feel. Okay. Yeah. And that gives that you would a be helpful. Time. All right. Let's do that. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, commissioners. Thanks. Good discussion. Uh, next, that will take us to city commission resolutions. We have one item before us tonight, and I need a motion to suspend the rules. So moved. Support. All those in favor of suspending the rules, say aye. Aye. Those opposed. It carries. Rules are suspended. Commissioners, this is an add-on tonight, uh, and it is a uh, related to a litigation matter, Michael Gentile versus the City of Grand Rapids uh, for a workers' compensation case. Uh, any questions or comments about that? No. Nope. Oh, moved. I need a motion. Can I get a motion? To move. Support. All right. Any questions or comments about this uh, litigation and compensation? No. All right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, it carries. All right, next that will take us to our public hearings. Uh, we have one public hearing tonight, a quite important one. Uh, this is a public hearing establishing property taxes and proposed fiscal year 2019 city budget. Uh, and so, who do I have? Scott all right, Shannon. Scott and, all right, come on up. Good evening, commissioners. Good evening, mayor. I am here to introduce the public hearing tonight establishing property taxes and the proposed fiscal 19 city budget. On April 24th, uh, you were presented with the city manager's FY19 preliminary fiscal plan. Uh, you spent many hours in the weeks thereafter listening to presentations from city staff, questioning staff, and deliberating on the budget. On May 22nd, uh, you adopted a resolution scheduling tonight's public hearing regarding this proposed budget as amended by the commission. This budget represents citywide appropriations in excess of $580 million, including approximately $142 million in the general fund. It occurred to the budget office that perhaps a 300-page fiscal plan, I have to find my seat over there, might not be everybody's cup of tea. And so we did compile a nice one-page brochure um, that I'm available to hand out tonight. It kind of goes through who the budget office is, what we do, uh, briefly walks through the fiscal plan, including uh, some key pages in the fiscal plan to kind of cut down on some of the reading. And there's also a link in this brochure to the full fiscal plan for those that are interested as well as budget office contact information. Additionally, on May 22nd, um, a public hearing was also established uh, for the property tax millage rates proposed to be levied to support the proposed budget. Uh, the public notice for this was published in the Grand Rapids Press on May 27th. The proposed fiscal 19 city millage rate is 8.971 mills. This represents a reduction of 0.0548 mills when compared to last year's millage rate. The reduction is due to a state law commonly referred to as the Headley Amendment, which requires rolling back millage rates when the city's overall taxable value of existing property grows at a rate greater than the consumer price index. The CPI rate used for 2018 property tax was 2.1% and is determined by the state. Uh, the city expects to receive just over $10.8 million in real property tax from these millage rates and an, an additional $907,000 in personal property taxes, as well as additional revenue in the form of miscellaneous industrial property taxes. That concludes my prepared comments, but I'd be happy to take any questions you might have at this time. All right. Commissioners, any questions or comments? 
All right, seeing none, I'll go ahead and have you take a seat and we'll open this up for public Thank comment. You. Thank you. So if you are here tonight to speak about the budget or the proposed budget before us, now's an opportunity to come forward. Same rules apply. We ask that you share your name and the city that you live in. Uh, fill out that little sheet up there and write down your name so that we can record it accurately. Uh, and um, I will now open this public hearing. So if you're here to speak about the budget, come on up. We'll start with Scott. Yes, my name is Scott Atchison. I work part-time in Ward 1, grew up in Ward 2, and I live in Ward 3. Mm -hmm. Basically, what I want you to do with your budget is take $200,000 out of the general fund and put it in an escrow account that someday you will be paying one of the construction companies here in town to build an information center right at Rosa Park Circle. Now, I want to give you an update since the last time, your last meeting. Um, it was brought up at the Community of the Whole meeting when you were reviewing the Downtown Development Authority budget that maybe it's time, when Tim Kelly was in front of this commission and you're reviewing the budget, maybe it's time to build the information center now because downtown is booming. Well, let me tell you, I sent an email out, didn't get a reply. So I made a phone call to Tim today and I said, Tim, I'm going to address the city commission. He called me back and we talked and he is interested. And I talked to Wayman Britt at the Kent County Executive Committee, and he's interested with Doug Small and the CVB. But I want you guys to get behind it, put $200,000 in an escrow account. You should be able to build a Taj Mahal of an information center for $200,000. You know, and, but then you guys would get reimbursed from the Downtown Development Authority funds. Somebody has got to take the lead on this and I need to push, prod, or motivate the Downtown Development Authority because that is their job. Their funds should be used for the Information Center and the Convention and Visitor Bureau should run it. And Tim said he is going to be calling a meeting with the people who were in the email chain after the May 22nd meeting. Roslyn, you need to get behind this too. I mean, it's good for the city, good for the county, good for the state, and at Rosa Park Circle, the Information Center will be surrounded by the downtown hotels, the convention center, and the Van Andel Arena. And let me tell you, this festival this year shrunk big time. I went by there Saturday and Sunday. It, it only went on Ottawa south to like Pearl Street. Never made it to Monroe Center. There was nothing at Rosa Park Circle this year for festival. You know, and I'm like, whoa, it shrunk big time. But there were still hundreds of people at Rosa Park Circle, and a lot of them are dancing with their cell phones looking for information. You know, and I'm telling you, humans in a booth are so much better for local information than your smartphone. And I'll be seeing you at the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. All right, others who wish to be heard on the budget that's before us tonight? Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, Josh Hunger, I'm a resident of the city of Grand Rapids. Um, and I also work at the Grand Rapids Chamber, so on behalf of the Chamber, uh, I want to share a few brief comments with you all tonight on the budget. Um, other than hiring a city manager, the approval of this budget is uh, the most important role of the commission, and I want to thank you all and the staff for all the tremendous work you've done. There's been a lot of robust conversations and deliberations and you know, probably thousands of hours pumped into this process, and on behalf of our membership, we appreciate the due diligence you guys give to this every year. I might be in the minority here, but I get very excited when I see orange barrels popping up all over the city. <laughs> Even on the way here, I don't know if that was intended. Maybe, <laughs> maybe Eric had something routed, so we'd have to see the, the investment being made. Um, but it's great to see it. It's all over the city. It's in every ward. We appreciate the continued general fund commitment to roads. It's, it's expediting the progress. Um, and it's great to see our roads returning to a, a state of good repair. Uh, I also want to applaud the continued prioritization of setting aside reserves. I know that this may have been drawn down a little bit this AM, uh, but you don't get many pats on the back for holding on to your cash. And so um, we wanted to applaud you for doing that and setting aside these money because it wasn't long ago when we had severe deficits and a lot of tough decisions to make. Uh, with growing concerns around the impact of unfunded liabilities in cities across the state and with projections for deficits in the future, these are critical decisions. Um, and to that point, I know there's been a lot of discussion about the street lighting um, in the plan there. We would just encourage due diligence to make sure that you consider all the variables. Uh, there's talks about the cost of electricity could go up for streets and how does that impact the payback. When you're going to issue bonds, uh, maybe totaling up to $20 million, and talking about other smart city initiatives, 
We just want to make sure that there's a complete plan that we can all get behind. Um, I might lose my job if I didn't mention a little bit about mobility and parking um, and challenges in the downtown. We're very encouraged with uh, our newer, our more recent partnerships in Mobile GR and the Rapid and some of the other great things that are going on. Um, but our members are still struggling uh, when it comes to the availability of monthly parking options, not visitor parking, monthly parking options. And we'd love to see this reflected in the capital plan. Um, in short, it's a great time to be in the city. Our members have encouraged us to be much more um, visible and vocal and engaged with you at the local level and other cities in the area. Uh, we're thrilled at the vibrancy and we're, we're here to share a positive message. Uh, we look forward to working collaboratively, collaboratively with you uh, in the coming fiscal year to grow the economy, celebrate successes, and address the challenges that will arise. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. All right. Others who wish to be heard? And again, this is, um, this is specifically to the budget. So if you're here and you want to speak to the budget, now's an opportunity to come forward. Mr. Miller, are you coming up to talk about the budget? Uh, all right. Well, if you want to come up, come on up. I'm going to close it in a minute if I don't see anyone else. Thank you to White Sheet Josh for reminding me about the, those street lights. I come up with, uh, it's, we were going to spend $8 million on it. It comes up to $450. Got that? 4500 per light bulb. So, what stuff Miller promises to award $25 to the citizen who, who comes up with the best light bulb joke? You know, I, we thought we'd heard all of them, but yeah, it's going to be. And the, whole, the uh, larger number I don't have right before me, but I mean, $450 per light bulb. Uh, executive office, 17 million. Uh, every salary there, we should see uh, with a full package for it, not just the salary, but, but the benefits. And uh, uh, it's absurd, it looks absurd, $17 million. Uh, going down engineering, uh, like to, uh, at 18 million, they destroyed the really cool U turn slip lane used by historic buses. I call it Michigan's Underground Railroad, and the Maori Rice could go up. Up uh, Ionia North and then down uh, Ottawa just before Michigan. That should certainly be restored. Uh, in terms, of, well, I'll get back to Scott's proposal later. later. Uh, 36 million seems excessive. Uh, overall, you uh, yeah, just a couple years ago, the, the core budget was 118 million. Now it's up to 142 million. Why are you knocking off all these fees early, earlier in the, e in the evening? Wouldn't they be useful in uh, trying to balance the budget? Uh, overall, we see 586 million, uh, but there's a 41 trillion dollar uh, uh, bond market out there. How much is being held by adversaries such as, such as Red China? I mean, could they pull the plug on it? I'm nervous about all those bondings. Police, uh, how do we figure, 60 or is it 70? If you toss in the district court, another 14 million. Let's analyze the vote of the cop. The cop paycheck vote is altogether different from the anti-crime or crime prevention uh, constituency. The cop paycheck vote, 85% of our cops are too snooty to live in Grand Rapids. Uh, you could easily pay half as much, go from 300 cops to uh, 600 cops. Detroit's still got 2,000, they're below 700,000. Chicago's got 13,000 cops. You divide that into 2,600,000 residents are talking one cop every 200. So it's under police. And uh, if you want to keep the, the crime prevention vote or the anti-crime vote, you could cut the salaries and half the cops and double the police force, okay? And you know how that's engineered. You also, we could also argue, well, everything that was passed at uh, City Hall, I saw no figures whatsoever on that. All right, uh, facilities and fleet management kindly uh, start plowing our sidewalks. One bizarre figure at the Rapid is that the best on-time performance is during the winter time. Why? Because uh, people can't, wheelchairs can't get out on the sidewalk. They're not plowing the sidewalks. I come, grew up in a civilized city where all the uh, sidewalks were plowed for oh, going to the forest thank railroads. You. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Your time is up. Thank you. All right, anyone else who wishes to be heard on the budget? Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna close that public hearing and that will be referred back um, to the city manager and will be before us next at our commission meeting. Oh. oh, that's okay, I didn't see you. I'm a little gun shy about speaking out on this issue. I spoke out two years ago and um, quite frankly, I, I feel like I was retaliated against when salaries came up for review 
but that is water under the bridge. Um, somebody made the comment that this is one of the most decisions you make all year, and I can't disagree with that. This is one of the largest budgets, if not the largest, that this city has ever passed. And while the economy may seem like it is going well right now, we still have to be mindful of the future and not forget the past. I went through the fiscal crisis at a bank. I know a lot of the city workers went through it at the city, but not everybody has recovered. And I, I think it's our responsibility to make sure that we not go back where we were 10 years ago. We still carry a lot of debt and a lot of unfunded liability. And I don't see enough being done to address that going forward. I know concessions already have been made, but we still have almost 300 million in unfunded liability. And I think we need to seriously consider every time we take on additional debt. I think refunding was a good tool when we could get lower interest rates, but we've also expanded our debt when we have done so. So if you are going to amend this budget when you come back in July, personally, as the comptroller and as a Grand Rapids resident and taxpayer all of my working life, I think you need to start addressing some of these issues sooner than later. I still have a minute left, but um, I didn't have anything prepared to say, so I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Um, awesome. Thank you. All right, anyone else who wishes to be heard about the budget? Okay, seeing none, I will go ahead and close that um, public comment or public hearing, and it'll be referred back to the city manager and the city commission will be taking it up next week at our city commission meeting. Uh, so that will take us to our last opportunity for public comment tonight. So this is an opportunity for you to come forward and speak about anything that is on your heart and mind. Uh, you, the same rules apply, so we ask that you come to the podium, that you share your name and the city that you live in, um, that you write down your name on that sheet of paper up there, and you'll be given up to three minutes to speak. Welcome. Welcome. My name is Bonnie Burke. I live in the second ward. I'm here tonight to address the upcoming vacancy for a seat in the third ward. First of all, I believe in lawful city government. When public officials are forthcoming with honesty and integrity, they earn the respect of the voters and instill confidence in the electorate. But when personal agendas are in play, they only earn the respect of those who must win at all cost. It is about perpetual power. <clears throat> I am questioning tonight why the appointment of an ineligible former two-term commissioner is even a discussion for this commission. It is clear from this charter language that eligibility ends after serving two terms as commissioner. This language is concise, it is well written, and a 2015 addition to the city charter, which does not need to be altered or amended, it simply needs to be followed. <clears throat> I question your abandonment of the appointment process which has existed and been working well and is the same process which brought several of you to this board in the first place. Instead of opening up the remainder of the vacated term to interested parties, listening to their qualifications and making your choice, you insist on the appointment of an ineligible term-limited former commissioner. You say it is his wisdom and experience you seek for the board. I contend that it is control of the board that you seek and it is the first step to chip away at term limits altogether. After all, why listen to the voters? And this is exactly why the citizens of this great city voted to term limit each and every one of you. Mayor Bliss, if it was not for term limits, Mr. Hartwell would likely still be sitting in your chair as mayor. You might be still serving as a second ward commissioner, 
Commissioner Jones would probably not be sitting in the second ward. Commissioners Reppert and O'Connor would likely not be sitting in your seats because the first ward commissioners would more than likely be serving. Mr. Allen would not have served for the past two and a half years. You see it as term limits that gave most of you here tonight the opportunity to serve as commissioners and mayor. And it is, it is term limits which has brought to this board new insights, skills, and diversity. It is term limits that will even allow several of you the chance to serve as mayor once Mayor Bliss has served two terms, if that is her intention. You should not be seeking the wisdom of an ineligible Mr. White. You should be respecting the wisdom of the citizens, the very people you serve, and the very people who voted for term limits. They have no agenda, and they have spoken. Thank you for listening to me tonight. Thank you, Ms. Park. Good evening. My name is Catherine Misch, and I live in the First Ward. I would like to follow on the comments of my good friend, Bonnie Burke, who just spoke to you. At your last meeting, Ms. Burke told you that a group of citizens is poised to file a lawsuit to challenge the eligibility of former City Commissioner James White to serve, once again, as a City Commissioner if this body appoints him to such a position. I would like to clarify what that type of lawsuit looks like for the benefit of this body, former Commissioner White, and the public. The legal cause of action would sound in quo warranto. That's an old Latin phrase that asks an elected official, by what right do you hold public office? It was a quo warranto action that recently removed the Macomb County clerk from office because she lied about where she lived, and she was therefore ineligible to hold office. It was also a quo warranto action that removed Jack Harper from office as Grand Rapids City Comptroller in 1974, when he became ineligible to continue serving in that elected office. You should understand that a legal cause of action, uh, that such a legal cause of action is not filed against the city and is not filed against this board, but is filed against the individual holding the elected office. Therefore, if this commission chooses to violate the city charter by appointing a term limited former city commissioner to another partial term of service on this commission, and if he accepts such appointment, should that group of private citizens proceed to file the lawsuit they have described against you, that lawsuit would be filed against Commissioner White individually. And if the citizens group prevails in the lawsuit and either the circuit court or an appellate court eventually rules that his appointment violated the city charter provision regarding term limits, then Mr. White was never validly seated as a city commissioner in 2018, which means that every vote cast by Mr. White from 2018 forward would be invalid, ab initio. That's another Latin phrase that means from the beginning. So each and every vote taken by Mr. White while seated at this table from 2018 forward could be declared void. And that means that every contract or appointment or other matter approved by a 4-3 vote in which Mr. White was in the majority actually failed as a tie vote retroactively, such as perhaps a vote to appoint a new city manager. You might wish to consider whether you want to introduce that type of uncertainty to all of your votes that will be taken over the course of the next year and a half. Thank you for the opportunity to explain these matters to you. I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. All right, others who wish to be heard? Hi, welcome. How are you doing? Good. Yeah, my name is Shane Smith. Okay. I'm with uh, West Side Cancer Crisis. We're, I don't know if you guys have heard about us, but we're a group of citizens that are concerned with the high rate of cancer on the city's southwest side specifically between the streets of Butterworth Avenue and Wealthy Avenue. Those streets all line the prior dump that was there before. It was shut down in 1973 due to high contamination. There was never any testing done in the residential neighborhoods. Every one of us has had a high impact in our family of cancer over there. For example, between the, uh, on the 300 block of Indiana, just alone, which is, be, which is the street, which is the block between Butterworth and Wealthy, there has been over 70 cases of cancer, approaching 80, just on that one block in the last 20 years. Most of them have passed away from it. 
my dad's entire generation is pretty much gone. I was going to prepare something for, to say today, but I'm kind of just going right at the heart on what we all are feeling. Yeah. We kind of feel like this has been kicked down the road long enough. Like I said, there was never any testing done over there. From what I understand, they decided not to test because of the groundwater going the opposite way towards the Grand River. But there was also contaminants in the soil itself on the landfill. I watched a webinar for the Rockford, uh, what's going on out in Rockford. They had scientists there from all over the country. Contaminants can blow up to two miles from where it's at, get in the air, and in the air, get in people's bodies, in their lungs, in their food, in the soil where they're growing their vegetables if they have a garden. Now we're sitting here investigating on our own, trying to figure out why there's so much cancer. I lost my dad to pancreas cancer. I lost my, gra my grandma to lung cancer. I lost my uncle to pancreas cancer. I have had, and just in my own family, a dozen people that lived on Indiana Street that have came down with cancer, and more than half of them have passed away from it. And now we feel like we're still having the can kicked down the road because we're left to investigate this on our own. Rupert, you showed some concern. Thank you. You're, you're in that ward, correct? Right over there. Mr. O'Connor, shame on you. You never once responded to any one of our, tech, our messages to you. Never showed no concern, nothing. I think we're just kind of getting fed up because we feel like this can is being kicked down the road. And we elected you people. Yep, yeah, ma'am, you can speak after, after Shane is done. A every single one of you can have an opportunity to speak if you like. We're here to listen. Yes, I, I just want something to be done. So, I think the soil needs to be tested over there. Because contaminants can fly up to two miles away, but the soil was never tested. Something needs to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you yep, you can yeah. come up. Just share sure. it. My share name it. is Donna Smith. Donna. I'm Shane's mother. Okay. Um, I've also got um, problems myself, lung disease. I lived on that street too. And um, I lost my ex-husband. Well, they, my kids did. Lost their father. My grandparents lost their grandfather. And all of their grandparents and uncles and aunt, everybody's dying on that street. My best friend died yesterday from from cancer herself. She lived on that street, was born and raised there. And we've reached out to these people. They've never once reached back to us. And we elected them. I think that's a shame. That shows what you care about. You don't care about us. I think that's wrong. That's all I got to say. Thank you, Donna. Hi, my welcome. Name, thank you. I'm Mitzi McCarty. This is my, my son to this cancer. I myself have breathing problems. And I lost my husband. And I just want to know that why didn't they, they even care? They put those houses over our landfill and didn't tell them people anything that this could be coming a problem. And now we're losing our families, our friends. You know, it's, it's, it's bad. It's really bad. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Hi, welcome. Hi. I'm Rebecca Woodruff. I've lost my mom, my brother. I've lost aunts, uncles, cousins that all lived right in the same area, all on Indiana. And it's, it's getting deep where nobody's even, it was always a joke to everybody about the stuff in the water, the stuff in the ground. Well, it's not a joke. It's affecting all of us. We've all been affected. Our kids have all been affected, our families, everywhere. I mean, this needs to be resolved. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Mine will be short and sweet. My name's Jamie Danner. Jamie. Um, <laughs> since we've started this researching and figuring out who's been affected and everybody on the street, it's the same story. Every time it's the same, you know, three, four, or five members in a family that have been, you know, deceased because of what's going on. We need answers. We need testing. That's it. Thank you, Jamie. All right. Others who wish to be heard? I forgot to also mention, 
My son-in-law lived over there for year, all his life. He passed away of lung cancer last year. My daughter was married to him for three years yeah. and then lost him. She found out three months after they got married. Yeah. That's all I've got to say. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Welcome. I'm Michelle Benitez. I am the union president of the Grand Rapids Dispatch Association. And I'm here due to an MLive article that came out today. It's concerning the proposed consolidation between the Kent County Sheriff's Department and the Grand Rapids Dispatch Centers. Uh, it seems there is now a firm deadline imposed by the county. And they quote say, if it's not met, then it's over and they'll walk away. Part of the estimated cost of the merger, according to a quote by the under Sheriff Young, was that they needed $3.2 million from the state and they hoped to get that through a grant. The state last week offered them 500,000 and it's yet to be determined who is gonna take the burden of what's left and how it's gonna be paid for. The primary concern that we have is for the residents of Grand Rapids, the expectations of service that they have, and in addition, our, the safety of our first responders. They uh, need immediate information at times when they're uh, pulling up on calls. We're able to provide that that I don't think Kent County will be able to do. Grand Rapids has put a significant amount of money towards our 311 center, but they are considering losing one of the most important parts of the city, which is the 911 center. We are singularly dedicated to the emergencies of the citizens of Grand Rapids. The police department as a whole has been working diligently on being transparent and providing a level of service that they uh, have come to expect and deserve. To my knowledge, there have been only a handful of meetings between the actual people that are being affected, which is the fire department, the dispatch center, the police department, and those in charge of those, and Kent County. There's not been much discussion. The scope of work that we do on a regular basis uh, consisted of at least five pages of items that the Kent County does not do currently. And that would require a significant amount of discussion before any decision could be made. Uh, Kent County is forcing a rush decision that comes with very high stakes for this city. And in closing, we feel that there has not been enough information provided to anyone to make an informed decision of this magnitude. And that would be it. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks. Uh, Jim Howe, Crescent Neighborhood. Um, Back on to the ordinance uh, for the rental application fees. I don't know if changes could be made between now and the time this goes forward to the public hearing section, um, or if what you approve tonight has to go through. Because uh, the other thing I wanted to point out was in number one, it says uh, before taking a rental application fee, rental property owners must disclose to the applicant in writing the criteria in which the application will be judged. If the applicant believes the application fee exceeds the screening process, which may include um, background checks, the applicant may file a complaint with the city manager and his or her designee. But then in number two, it says the application fee for rental property shall not exceed the cost of screening process, which may include all the background check information. And it says if the applicant believes the application fee charged in violation of this section, a complaint must be filed with the city manager within 10 days of the dated application. So if I don't submit an application, I could bring it to the city manager anytime I want, but if I submit an application, I'm restricted to notify the city manager within 10 days. And what's missing from this ordinance and the previous one is what happens after that is submitted? Because I'm sure Mr. DeLong, who oversees 1,500 people in a four, $150 million budget really has time to be doing checks on how much a background fee costs. I, I, 
obviously it's a placeholder for someone, but it turned from the clerk's office to the city manager. So the clerk's office, who could probably tell us exactly how much off the top of their head a background check costs, because they run them, is it's been taken out of their department and brought to the very top of our city government for that guy to look into, or woman, uh, th after his uh, internship. Um, so I have, uh, so I have another, so that as well is a concern of mine. It feels as though um, there have been um, roadblocks put in place, um, whether purposely or not. In, previous, in the previous one that was provided to us, the previous draft, uh, when the application, application fee for rental property shall not exceed the cost of the screening of the background checks, um, Written information on the actual cost of the screening process shall be made available to the applicant upon request. This written information shall include the following statement. All complaints that the rental application fee exceeds the actual cost of screening should be directed to the City of Grand Rapids Clerk's Office. To me, that's a clear step because the Clerk's Office will have to have policies and procedures of how to handle that. Not that the City Manager wouldn't, but there's a big difference between an office and a person. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right, others wish to be heard? Thank you. Good evening, uh, Robert Metzger. I'm actually from East Grand Rapids. I just spend substantial or most of my time at 312 Prospect Avenue Northeast in Grand Rapids. Uh, I am speaking into the commission uh, tonight regarding the traffic signal at Prospect in Michigan, and I need to express some gratitude to Eric DeLong for uh, helping jar loose the prerequisite study uh, that I received two days after the last commission meeting. Uh, note that that study did not commence until after I beat up on MDOT for what Grand Rapids was not doing. The study was done during April with comments in May. And as we all know, Michigan Street was torn up for most of April, so how accurate was that study? Also, there was no uh, plans uh, addressed regarding pedestrian flow. Uh, when I received the amended study, I decided to FOIA for the original study, because obviously that an amended study must have something that preceded it. Uh, I had asked for that study from John Bartlett early part of April, I think it was April 6th, who and he had confirmed the existence at that time. I got the study two days after that FOIA request, so it's appreciated. That study that the commission used to make all of its relevant decisions was based on a modeling of 1,600 parking spots, 2,000 parking spots, and 24 parking spots, Michigan and Prospect. That study included traffic signal warrants for all relevant intersections except the principal one, Prospect in Michigan. So essentially the commission made its decisions on a study that didn't correspond to the actual project and there was no traffic warrant. A couple of quickies as far as issues with the study, as I mentioned, the pedestrians. There's also the issue with the offset between the north and south of Michigan, um, the Prospect Street not lining up. Uh, as far as the map in front of you, what you have there is uh, uh, property parcels north of Michigan. And you can see where GVSU made some property swaps that I could ascertain from, GV, uh, from uh, Spectrum in 2015, and that transformed into the ramp project. Uh, I guess as a private citizen or any private developer, you'd be required to submit a site plan for something like that. And so I'm here with you tonight to ask that this commission remember at some point in the future, since I'm looking at this all wrong, as being a concerned landlord, maybe I should be more absentee and not worry about people's safety and what's going on in my neighborhood. Um, that the commission remember when I approach the commission with something in say a year or two from now, that I get the same amount of generous interpretation of the ordinance 
as well as the process that Spectrum and GS GPSU are getting. So thank I'm afforded thank the same opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Robert. Hi, Welcome. my name is Pete Schepanik. I'm here as a member of the Westside Cancer Crisis. Um, although I no longer live in the neighborhood, uh, I spent the first 30 years of my life living there. I was born in 1964, grew up in that neighborhood. I lived on Butterworth Street. Um, we are now into the third generation of family members with cancer. Um, I lost my father and my mother. My sister passed away of pulmonary disorders. Uh, both my grandparents, aunt, uncle, cousin, all in the same neighborhood, G Lock Street, Butterworth Street. Um, I was diagnosed last October with cancer. I'm currently battling that. Um, I'm not here to blame any one corporation, any company. I'm not here to blame the current uh, commission. Um, but I definitely think this needs to be looked into. Um, as a kid playing in the neighborhood down there, you know, trips to the dump <laughs> were great. We had a blast going down there when we dumped our own garbage and stuff like that. Um, and I just think uh, the explanation that everything flowed into the river and away from everything is misleading. I, th I think there's just too many coincidences here and too many people involved. And I think this really needs to be looked into. I think some studies need to be made. Um, again, I'm not trying to blame anybody. I'm not looking for a big handout or a reward. I just think, you know, enough is enough. Three generations of families torn apart by cancer. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. <clears throat> Thanks for coming. Hello. Hello. My name is Sandy Stuckhart. Some of you know me from my former community development work. Um, what you don't know about me is that I'm Pete's brother, or her sister, and I was born and raised on the west side. And as Pete said, we've had multiple, multiple family members who have passed away from cancer. And what I will, want to remind you about is the history of our city, the history of our neighborhoods. This was an old Polish neighborhood at one point in time, and you're gonna find um, generation after generation of generation of people who are coming forward with this issue. And really what's simply being asked of you, especially the two first ward commissioners, is to get organized. You know, we got DEQ working on it, an attorney has now been hired, and my brother and I are working on pulling together a family history. What years our family lived there, how long they lived there, what type of cancer they died. We will be submitting that information to um, the attorney. But I think, in all fairness, I know how neighborhoods work, and I think you two first ward commissioners need to get a little more organized, pull together a neighborhood meeting, get DEQ at the meeting, and take this thing really seriously. You're gonna have a Rockford um, world um, Wolverine worldwide on your hands with this because nobody's going to stop. Right now you're hearing from the people who are living and who are mad and who have currently have had cancer, but the generations are going to come forth. And uh, it's going to happen. That, uh, we're uh, sorry, but we're, um, we're now going back to our forefathers and we are paying for their mistakes. And it's not really something that you caused, but it's something you need to get involved in. That's all I got to say on the matter. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. It's good to see you. Thanks, you too. Hi, welcome. Good evening. My name is Eric John Chapaniak. I live in Alpine Township. Um, so still have a GR mailing address, but not in the city anymore. Um, I grew up here in Grand Rapids. Um, I'm a member of the Kennewa Hill School Board now, and um, it's a lot of work, but it's rewarding work at the same time. Um, I had a couple things to bring up that just came to mind. Uh, I'm going into social studies and education, so my whole life is gonna be about engaging young people and getting them um, into the political process. So I wanted to inform you of some things you might not be aware of. The cities of East Lansing and Ann Arbor require landlords to give out voter registrations when a new tenant signs to live there. Um, and I think that would be something um, we're talking about on this board or one of the committees um, that the city has established. 
um, because this would help a lot of people that might be um, students at one of the colleges in the area um, get registered to vote there or just anyone who's going to be a new resident of the city to get them engaged. Um, this came about because of Michigan State University and the University of Michigan's student governments pushing this um, and the Grand Valley Student Senate does um, support this measure as well as the Office of Student Life at Grand Valley where I work for over the summer. Um, we're also working in Allendale Township and housing places around Grand Valley to make that happen um, out, on, uh, out on the Allendale campus as well. Even your elections. Um, Walker now has even your elections. Um, this has saved the city $25,000 per year and they only have nine precincts and three wards of the city. They just made this swap in February because it was a cost-saving measure and because it forced um, people who were running for city office to target more than just the absentee voters or the habitual voters that vote in every off-year election, but made them go out, or at least um, the thought is it will make them go out and engage more of their community, hear from more people in their community. The voter turnout um, in these odd year elections was around 5% habitually, so swapping over to even year elections will hopefully increase the voter turnout because it'll line up with gubernatorial and presidential elections. School board elections were also pushed in November of even years a few years ago to save on cost mainly. Um, and then lastly, for the audience and for all of you, um, online voter registration, Senate Bill 426 through 430 would now allow for online voter registration. It passed the Senate. Um, there are 38 states that currently allow you to register to vote online, but not Michigan. So if you know your state rep, and if anyone in the audience feels passionately that you should be able to register to vote online, please reach out to your state reps because it's in their chamber now. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. <clears throat> Good to see you. All right, others who wish to be heard? Russell Olmstead, West Side, Grand Rapids. I can hopefully write and talk. But uh, I just wanted to thank you all for approving the Cure Violence uh, or funding to get that rolling anyways this morning. Um, I think it's a, a phenomenal program, has a ton of possibilities, and I'm, I'm really happy to see that we are uh, taking these steps to actually uh, progress that uh, forward in our city. So. Uh, uh, aside from that, I really agree wholeheartedly with everything that Jim has been saying this evening uh, about the ordinance on, on the uh, rental application fees. Um, the, the ordinance itself and the proposal in its current form doesn't seem to really be any sort of regulatory outline. It, it, it seems to be way too open-ended to be uh, uh, thought of in that way. Uh, so I don't know if it can be amended uh, from here on out, but the points that he's brought up, I definitely second. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. All right, others wish to be heard? <clears throat> Impertinence. Watchdog Miller back. Impertinence, that's what Ms. Mish is addressing here. It's, it's uh, uh, an impertinence uh, against people, uh, Bonnie Burke and her colleague, uh, Rena as House Davis should be fully compensated for her all the work they put in, including a, a city payroll pay. Uh, <coughs> first of all, Hanoi Hartwell appointed White. Why, why didn't he appoint back in 2003? Why did he not consider a veteran for, for that? The plenty of veterans in Third Ward. Uh, I fully, what you did to Sarah Vanderworth was was totally tacky. Restore her paycheck, and it was it was retaliatory against her. You know. I mean, um, what can you say? It's not what the voters expect for you to swipe to steal half her paycheck. Uh, next, in terms of Scott Atchison, uh, I'm going to pr propose, uh, Madam Commissioner, uh, Madam President, uh, Lenura, uh, a, a, a panel to preview view the next third award candidate. You could chair it if you're willing to serve on that panel. People like uh, Mr. Atchison, who's maybe been the most persistent 
uh, witness over the years in the third ward, uh, Denard Robinson, uh, Dr. Pulliam's son. Uh, I have more before you, but I can send you a letter if possible on it. And it's up to you whom you want to appoint, but just some ideas. People who have third ward credibility and know the third ward. Pastor Moody comes to mind. Uh, he lives in the third ward side. Business is on the first ward side across Jefferson. Uh, so uh, I don't have that full list here. Uh, in terms of um, Mr. Atchison's proposal, to get a handle on what he's proposing there, you can go in the McKay Tower lobby uh, at Camp Powell Square, Rosa Parks Circle, and uh, in the lobby, the marvelous uh, pictures of different areas. Sometimes that information center was there. Was it a, simply a uh, convenience station for uh, the public? Uh, I'm unclear of that. That would disappear. And it was also a, uh, a cop station there to direct traffic and also the rapid then, with horse rail cars and street cars running, had uh, uh, dispatchers there to monitor all the cars coming, uh, street, uh, the uh, horse rail ca cars coming through. So uh, the uh, Butterworth crisis is just appalling. I was always leery of it. It was first a German-speaking neighborhood. It was German-speaking before Germany was created. Germany wasn't created to, until 1871, as you recall. <laughs> but then it became Polish. Uh, Vib truly vibrant Polish parishes in there, and what the, I've always been learning, Lurie, what's going on there. Uh, Hartwell moved the um, the, uh, the trash sorting center uh, away from uh, the market core out into that neighborhood, which came later, uh, and uh, it seemed like we we're picking on that neighborhood. So it's another uh, example and of anti-Catholic Mr. abuse. Mr. Miller, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your input. All right, anyone else who wishes to be heard tonight? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to close that public comment period, and I will turn to my colleagues up here, and I'll start down here with uh, Commissioner Rapart. Yeah, I just, uh, it's good to be in this building. Um, the principal here, Troy Wilborn, is just uh, one of the best in GRPS, and so I'm grateful for their, their hosting us tonight. Um, and I just want to say thanks to the Homes for All people who, sh who showed up again tonight to speak and advocate. And I hear these, um, these concerns around the Butterworth site, and I live a block from there now. And so I it was encouraged that Kent County met with them, and I'm eager to find out what that is. But, uh, you know, I'll talk with my colleague John uh, and figure out uh, what we can do, we've we've met, we've talked with city staff, and we're we're um, not sure not sure what to do at this point. But um, but we hear that and take it very seriously and care about it. So John and I'll talk, and we'll figure out what the next steps are for us. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Kelly. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Again, I want to thank Holmes for all for your comments tonight, and. Uh, and thank you, Commissioner Ruppert, for your response. It's heart-wrenching to hear those stories and, and their spheres. On a little bit lighter note, I just wanted to mention something that a constituent of ours um, brought up to me that I thought was worth sharing with the commission and anybody who's still here, and that is a new trend that I hope will come here, just like Vision Zero did from the Scandinavian countries. This is, also, this is coming from Sweden, and it's called plogging. So plugging is when you jog with a plastic bag and you pick up trash <laughs> as you're going. I know we sent that to you. And it's spreading <laughs> all around the world. So I think this is, it was a great idea that we encourage people to plug when you're taking a walk or a jog, grab a plastic bag with you and pick up some trash. She always, the person in the article always, always wore a pair of gloves too, which you might want to do. <laughs> and get rid of it, because we're all out there getting exercise. We might as well do something a little extra to clean up the environment. Yeah. So well, let's plug away. <laughs> Commissioner, uh, you can start a plugging plug campaign. <laughs> plugging <laughs> campaign. <laughs> uh, Commissioner O'Connor. Yeah, I, I too want to. It's exciting always to be on the west side, especially in a place uh, here at GRPS that holds such a special place in my heart. And uh, it's just great to have everyone out here. Um, I, I too echo my colleague Kurt's comments. You know, I, I lived on Layden Street, uh, Southwest, for eight years, just you know, like throw a baseball to the dump. Um, and in fact, I think that house might have been built on some dump at some point. Um, so it's scary. And so yeah, it's not really knowing where to go from here, but certainly committed to 
to seeing what part we can play in helping everyone further understand what it is happen as it may have happened and how we might be part of addressing it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Lanier? Yes, I'd like to thank everyone for coming this evening and sharing their remarks, as well as um, thank um, GRPS for opening up their doors this evening for us. Um, there were some very touching um, public comments, and um, I'm happy to know that you all are having some conversations and meetings are happening, and keep us abreast because I am you know, extremely concerned. Um, so as you all learn things, please um, share, because to hear stories like that, and <clears throat> you know, there may not be a, um, um, a process in place for us to hear back, so if you can just um, do whatever you can and make sure that we're aware of what those next steps are. Um, I wanna thank Asante Kane, if he has not left, thank you because he was um, peddling safe pitch night um, flyers when I walked in. I think he saw my car pull up. No, I'm just kidding. Um, sharing the information about the upcoming pitch night for um, safe. And I also want to thank those who came out to the Indian Trails golf outing last Friday um, to help us raise funds for our youth um, for um, Parks and Rec. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lanier. Uh, city, interim City Manager? It's been a majorly uh, long day, and I don't want to prolong it any, so thank you for uh, your, your role and, and good work today. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you. City Attorney? Okay. I'm going to um, add my thanks to everyone who came out uh, and to Harrison Park for hosting. Uh, and then I, too, am going to request uh, regular updates. Uh, I know that we, the city, is working in partnership with the county right now. Uh, so either city staff or first ward commissioners, if you would keep this full body up to date um, on on what is happening and progress, that would be really appreciated. So thank you, thank you all for coming out. Good to be here on the west side. Have a good night. We're adjourned.